Yes, so welcome again. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Suraya Hoja with us today. Uh, last week uh, we had uh, Halil Bakhtai and um, at a meeting that we had with uh, all the academics, he was saying that he was very proud uh, to be with, uh, in the same department with the Suraya Hoja, because apparently Suraya Hoja was one of the external, er, external examiners. I mean, that was a really nice anecdote of his thesis. So he is what we call Hojaların, she is what we call Hojaların Hojası. So we're very, very happy to have her. And, you know, I would be surprised if anybody working on Ottoman history, particularly Ottoman cultural history, uh, who hasn't come across her work. I was just writing something on Evliya Çalbi myself uh, last week, and of course, I had to quote her as well. Uh, and uh, she's with us today to talk about uh, Chinese and Ottoman modes of consumption. I'm very, very, very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Is, do I, is my vo does my voice carry? I don't know whether people in back can hear me. Maybe I should put this here. Well, what I would like to share with you today is basically a book that, uh, on paper at least, is due to come out tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> at least that's what Brill says. <laughs> and uh, the story is that my friend Elif Akchetin, who is a, uh, a Chinese historian of the 18th century, and your obedient Jaria, that we have co-edited a volume on consumption in the 18th century. We're both people concentrating on the 18th century. And, well, we both found when we uh, realized that we are both interested in this issue, uh, that there really was not that much literature. And, I mean, some of you, those of you who are familiar with Ottoman history will know uh, that there was an, a volume put out by Donald Quartert in the year 2000, uh, Consumption in the Ottoman Empire, and it's still the only volume uh, that has consumption in the title. However, in, you know, there have been quite a few studies, and to give you an idea, I have distributed uh, those little sheets of paper, they make no claim to being, you know, complete biograph bi bibliographies. They are simply what you might call reading lists for, you know, seminars. But it will give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, I haven't done this for the Chinese side, for basically mainly for the reason that the books will probably cannot be found here. And, I mean, you can probably get a few things from the Internet, and anyhow, I would have had to ask Elif to do this. On the other hand, once this book really sees the light of day, it does have a comprehensive bibliography, and Elif did the Chinese part, and uh, I did the others, so then you will be able to see it. For those who are curious, I've got a copy of the title page if somebody wants to take a look. I haven't seen the book myself. Uh, I mean, it, ca uh, it probably will not come until sometime late next month, but the official date is tomorrow. Okay, now, I mean, first of all, all of this would not have been possible if it had not been for Elif's work. I mean, uh, some of you may know, those of you who are interested in European history, that there has been an interest among British historians uh, dealing with the 18th century with the importation of Chinese goods, and that's especially porcelain, but then also tea. And, I mean, in the 18th century, England becomes a tea-drinking country, and uh, they then for a while 
the tea is very expensive and there's a great deal of smuggling going on. And those of you who have seen Hitchcock's movies, you may know that he once did a historical film, which was rare in Hitchcock's oeuvre, but there is one, and it is about smuggling and tea smuggling uh, on the English coasts in the 18th century. Uh, it, it, it was done just before he left England. Yeah, which, what's the film again? I, I, have to, I don't have the title right now. Jamaica Day? Yeah, that's it, that's it. Mm. So therefore, I mean, uh, people, especially like Maxine Burke, have been very interested in what you might call the enhancement of domestic life through goods imported from China. And I mean, uh, silk plays a role there. Silk becomes more abundant. Uh, porcelain plays a role there. Tea plays a role there. So it's a variety of you know consumer goods meant to be used, uh, usually in a domestic setting, and uh, this becomes. As, you know, something that people talk about and that people attach meanings to. And one author, for instance, pointed out that it made a difference whether you, you have people of the upper middle class drinking tea in their salon or whether you have working class people who drink sugar tea as you know, something to get uh, because they want to need to get warm, and because the sugar kind of is an extra, uh, a few extra calories. So therefore, presumably, uh, people attached different meanings. And well, I remember when we were students in Indiana. Uh, I mean, uh, one of my friends had good quality tea in tea bags. And these things were a little expensive for our student budget. And she used to dry them on the heater in our dormitory. And then we'd make another cup of tea out of the same tea bag the next day. And I still remember that when it really didn't work, she would say, I now pronounce this tea bag dead. <laughs> so you can see that again, I mean, oh, we could have had lower quality tea uh, as much as we wanted. But somehow, for both of us, this particular good quality was important. And so we attached, both of us, a special meaning to it. And therefore, you know, is the tea bag still alive or is it dead? So this is the sort of thing that historians dealing with 18th century consumption in England have, you know, become very much interested in. And then the question is, okay, a lot of these items came from China. Well, what's the situation in China? And it turns out that for Chinese historians, and now of course I'm repeating what Elif Akjitin has taught me, there was a kind of, you might say, constraint. It was not considered good form to be very lavish in consumption. Uh, elegant simplicity was supposed to be the norm. Uh, even for the emperor, uh, he was not supposed to, you know, show himself bedecked with jewels. On the other hand, it, when you look closely, this doesn't mean that people didn't consume. And what's more, you'll see this in a minute, they wrote about what was available for consumption. So, I mean, uh, another reason why people were for a long time not interested in consumption was because while Chinese consumption in the 18th century was quite substantial, 
Well, it didn't lead, at least not directly, to industrialization. And for a long time, that was kind of, uh, you know, the, the main concern of economic historians. Uh, did industrialization happen or did it not happen? And if it didn't happen, then kind of what happened before was only of marginal interest. Now, I mean, in China, as you probably know, uh, things happened in the 19th and 20th centuries that really did limit consumption. That was the Opium Wars, the British uh, aggression trying to force the importation of opium into the country. It was then a major domestic uprising and then in the 20th century, uh, I mean the Japanese occupation, and then I mean the socialist experiment, including the 1960s Cultural Revolution. So there were all sorts of reasons why consumption was quite limited. Now, in the Ottoman situation, we have something similar. I mean, uh, in the 20th century, for a considerable time, we were living with an, in an import substitution system. And I mean, in many cases, the goods that were produced domestically were of very poor quality. And you be, really had only two options. You could decide to not use them at all or you would have to use whatever was on the market. I mean, I remember that our water heater in Ankara was of such terrible quality that in the end, I wound up boiling water in a huge tea kettle and mixing it with cold water and taking my bath there because I just refused to deal with the water heaters that were available at that time. So yeah, well, if it's like that, uh, then, or in those days, in Ankara at least, uh, if, you had, if you were a woman and you had a size 40 shoe, you were out of luck because even the larger shoe shops only stocked one type of shoe, size 40. Now, in those days, size 40 wasn't so common. Today, it's very common. But, I mean, it still, it meant that all the women in Ankara who had a size 40 shoe were basically wearing the same shoe because there was no other. Well, in, in that kind of situation, of course, con there is not much motivation to look at consumption, as you can imagine. And therefore, I mean, it was really the interest did in consumption happened from, let's say, the late 80s and then the 1990s, uh, with, you know, the change over from an import sub substitution set up to a, subst and, and a set up where export was the major issue. Well, I mean, if you want to export, you have to produce goods that are exportable, and that meant also that the goods available on the domestic market uh, became, came to be of better quality. So therefore, it's, I think it's not by chance that people got interested, and then of course, well, why contrast the Ottoman Empire and China? Well, because we are using Chinese-made consumer goods every, you know, almost every hour of the day. I mean, you just look around at, at clothes, at all sorts of things, and you will see, you know, at least that they have been partly made in China to the extent that, you know, India, the traditional textile producer, people say, oh, well, we feel the Chinese competition. So therefore, I mean, as, we all use Chinese uh, consumer goods, whether we are aware of the fact or not. Uh, I mean, it seems to make sense to look at the two societies, 
and that's what we have tried to do. And I mean, I have been, uh, there is a table of contents of this book which is sitting there, and if you uh, would like to pass it through the lines, then, you know, it's, yeah, so people can take a look, because we've got like uh, 16 contributions, eight on the Ottoman Empire and eight on China, in both cases uh, focusing on the 18th century. I mean, not 100%, there's something from the late 17th or from the mid 19th, but basic, the basic focus is the 18th century. And I mean, well, uh, once you get into this, I think the first thing you need to say is the enormous difference in size in terms of pop. Incidentally, here there are people who are now late, and maybe somebody could give them this so they can take the bibliographies. Okay. So, therefore, I mean, first of all, we have to look at the difference in size. I mean, you probably know we don't have very good estimates for Ottoman population, but the general assumption at the end of the 16th century, well, the minimum somewhere maybe around 22 million, the maximum, and some people say that that's overly optimistic, 30 million, somewhere in that range, roughly. I mean, that's, I have not calculated this, but that's what you find in the literature. Well, in China, the population figures are a lot better. And it turns out that even after the enormously destructive Mongol conquest in the late 13th century, uh, China had 60 million inhabitants meaning twice the population of the Ottoman Empire in a fairly prosperous period of its existence. And then in the 18th century, I mean, there had been another dip in the middle of the 17th century due to the Manchu conquest, but after that, with peace re-established, the population grew by leaps and bounds. Some was due to the conquest of outlying provinces, but a lot of it also due to natural increase. And by the 18th century, uh, the population of the Chinese empire was somewhere around 200 million. I mean, a little more than that, but we can say roughly that, which means like seven times the Ottoman Empire. And I mean, that, uh, the reason why I emphasize this is because I often get student papers in which they say, oh, the Ottoman Empire at it, it, its most flourishing time was the greatest empire on earth. Mm -hmm. And every time I read that, I scratch my head and think, oh my God, these people's <laughs> world and ends somewhere in Erzurum, uh, or in Diyarbakir, or maybe in Baghdad. Uh, but I mean, what's east of that, apparently, uh, is kind of, uh, you know, outside of uh, people's range of vision. So therefore, you know, the disparity in population and also is worth thinking about, and then also, the possibility, the agricultural possibilities. Uh, I mean, China has two huge rivers, the Yangtze and the Yellow River, and there is a, an enormous canal, the, the so-called Great Canal, uh, which supplied Beijing. And uh, so therefore, uh, I mean, agricultural production also was considerably higher, and uh, it, possibilities for irrigation were better. So we must think in terms of, well, at least an upper layer of society, 
uh, that was probably much larger than in the Ottoman Empire, and these people also had more money. And I mean, that's something that you need to keep in mind, because, I mean, if you read Lutfi Gücer or Murat Cezakça, uh, then you will find that, or uh, Caroline Finkel, you will find that an enormous proportion of what was available to the Ottoman treasury went for war. Now, all empires wage war, and so did the Chinese. But because there was more available, there was something left after the wars had been paid for. On the other hand, I mean, if you read, for instance, a short history of the late Ottoman Empire, uh, there the author will say, well, consumption didn't really change that much until the late 19th century. It, and, well, many of us think that that's probably an exaggeration, uh, that probably what was happening was that in the Ottoman world of the 18th century too, we get an expanded consumption and then in especially the late 19th and early 20th century, we get, a, you know, wars and uh, people getting driven out of their homes and plundered and this and that, and the result is that consumption uh, kind of, you know, becomes very minimal. And there is a very nice story for this. My colleague Halis Akter, uh, in Ankara, uh, he's a specialist on agriculture. And he told me that when he started to work in this field, he thought that agricultural machinery was an absolute novelty in 1950s Turkey. But then when he started to work historically, he realized that that wasn't true. There had been a limited quantity of agricultural machines in the late Ottoman Empire, especially in places like Chukurova, but all this disappeared without a trace, you know, during, uh, there was after all an 11 year period of war, uh, and which was enormously destructive, and agricultural machinery disappeared completely. And yeah, in the 1950s, uh, it came in as a novelty, even though in real life, uh, you know, old people would have remembered that this had already been there once. So this is, I think, important to see. Uh, and I mean, now let's take a look at the section, you know, that you might call the possessions of the Qing elite. Now, first of all, who, who are the people that we call the elite? And there, too, there, is, there has been some debate among Chinese historians. An older school of thought thought that there was only a small upper level of higher level bureaucrats, and then below them there was a, you know, vast, undifferentiated mass of poor people. Well, I mean, more recent research has shown that that's not really a realistic assessment, that we have quite a few, you might say, intermediate groups. First of all, in the 18th century, uh, merchants become much more important than they had been, uh, let's say, uh, a century or two earlier. And especially the salt merchants have become very rich. And then the interesting thing is when you want to be rich, when you are rich, you want to show this. And in China, it's very important to show this in the proper way, meaning not to not be vulgar, uh, 
And this, you know, if you are vulgar and you go around, you know, Sorodan Gurme, uh, you know, with all sorts of things shiny here and there, well, then you don't gain prestige. And therefore, there are, people, there is a demand among these nouveau riches for, let's say, uh, you know, books that tell them what to consume. And I mean, sometimes I think that there are some people in Ankara who could use those books. I don't know whether you have ever seen the entrance hall to the Marriott Hotel in, uh, or, you know, in, a, uh, well, it's near Bachili Evler. And I mean, it's this thing, it looks like, you know, uh, it looks like the palace of a pharaoh. And it is really the entrance lobby to the Marriott Hotel, I mean, really now. Mm, but, I mean, uh, this is the sort of thing that apparently in China was a no-no. And, I mean, by building, th putting up things like that, you showed that you were a vulgar and uneducated sort of person. Now, uh, then, uh, you know, there are Book, there are books about consumption. And differently from the Ottoman Empire, where, as you know, printing was very, very limited before the 19th century, uh, in, in China, things get printed. Uh, I mean, usually, it's uh, not the movable type that we know. It may be that they get incised on wood blocks. We will see an example uh, later on. But, I mean, in any event, a lot of this material is available in print. And uh, apparently, the number of people who can handle written texts is far larger because, I mean, you will see they write about all sorts of things. I mean, about how to, to decorate your house and how, you know, what kinds of plants to plant and what kinds of flowers. Well, these kinds of debates happened in Istanbul as well. We know that there were associations of people who competed for the best tulips. And I, uh, in fact, they had prize-winning prize competitions and classified the tulips according to, you know, what uh, certain characteristics, like some of the things that we like in tulips, they didn't like at all. And uh, a lot of our tulips in spring would not have even rated a mention in, uh, you know, the uh, clubs of Ottoman tulip-fancying gentlemen. But there were tulip fanciers who came together, but they never printed the, their works. So therefore, I mean, even if they wrote about them, and they did, because otherwise we wouldn't know about them, uh, but all this remained in manuscript, and therefore, I mean, it didn't have the wide distribution that similar writings had in China. And then we get something, you know, in the Ottoman world, the novel arrived very late uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century, really. But in China, that's not so. I mean, I once read in translation an absolutely fascinating novel written in the 18th century called The Scholars. And it was about a man who had failed the examinations for the highest level of the bureaucracy. So he had become an instructor teaching other people to pass the exam that he had never been able to pass. And this uh, story has all sorts of ramifications and some of them are very funny because, you know, you change a few things here and there and, well, they're very familiar to us, too, even though, you know, we live uh, like uh, 300 years later. 
Mm. So therefore, I mean, uh, you have novels, and in novels, it is normal to describe the settings in which these uh, events take place. So that's why we know about the villas of the salt merchants of Yangzhou, who were apparently, you know, very wealthy and who set up not only villas but also gardens. And the gardens are still there. I mean, I, uh, when preparing this, I went into the internet and looked for Yangzhou, and sure enough, it said it's one of the most touristic towns of China, and it's famous for its gardens. And then came pictures of the gardens. So, I mean, therefore, uh, we have these Yangzhou salt merchants who are who create places that are meant to be worth seeing. I mean, that's where they invite their friends, and that is where, you know, people then will write about so-and-so's garden or so-and-so's villa, and this kind of description also finds its place in the novels of the period. Well, and then, I mean, we get something, and you will see in a minute, you know, we all, I think, are interested in Evliya Chelebi, and we've all somehow had contact with his writings. But one of the reasons why he continues to fascinate is because he's more or less unique. I mean, before the late 19th century, there are no seahat names. There is anyhow no seahat name of this size ever afterward. And I mean, Evliya is interested in all sorts of things. He's interested in food. He is interested in clothes. He is interested in buildings. He is interested in funny stories, lots of those. And on it goes. And well, I mean, it's not that in the Ottoman world, nobody except Evliya was interested. But most people apparently didn't think that this was worthy of being written down. And I think that has something to do with the fact that the people, the number of people who were comfortable with literacy was also more limited. And therefore, you know, writing is something special. I, I mean, you know that older people used to gather up pieces of paper because, and uh, refused to throw them away if there was writing on them because they said, well, maybe the name of God is written on them. Well, that means that they were completely illiterate because otherwise they could have recognized whether the name of God is on, on the paper or not, right? And this particular custom would not have come into being. On the other hand, it seems that in China, in at least this period, in the 18th century, it was, you know, uh, reading, writing, paper, printing, were all more accessible to a larger number of people, and there was a larger number of people anyhow, to begin with, and I think that explains the difference. So, I mean, writing about the pleasures of life is something that is a recognized feature of 18th century writing. As I said, it's a pity Evliya never went to China, uh, because there he would have found people who kind of seemly, seemingly had a similar outlook uh, on life. Uh, also, and this is, I think, uh, very interesting, the Qing emperors try to become, you might say, leaders of fashion. Now, this is something that we don't get in the Ottoman world. Uh, the Ottoman sultan is very remote, very unique, and he doesn't try to, you know, people, he, people are not encouraged to imitate imperial pomp. But in China, up to a, up to a point, 
that is possible. Uh, for one, I mean, one of the difficulties, the Chinese Qing emperors have what you might call a legitimacy deficit, namely that they are not Han, Han Chinese. And at the same time, they have to make themselves acceptable in the long run to the majority population. And the majority population is Han Chinese, and the Chinese bureaucracy has a millennial tradition already, and it's been there long before the Manchus had ever emerged from their forests. And so therefore, uh, you know, they want to be acceptable. And this means that, uh, especially when the emperors are younger, that they try to in in initiate fashions. And I mean, uh, this is especially true among the, the warriors, because a lot of the military leaders are also Manchu. And uh, we find, for instance, that the emperor will have, before a campaign, he will gather his Manchu generals for, and they will eat Manchu dishes that are not offered to the Chinese population that I think also Chinese uh, officials would not be interested in eating. And then uh, sometimes the emperor, if he is young, he will get up and offer uh, alcoholic drinks to the generals who are older than he is. So, you know, there's a question of age, and, you know, he does, probably doesn't do that when he himself is an old man, but when he's a young man and he has elderly generals, then that will happen. So you can see that, I mean, in certain situations toward the Manchus, the Qing emperor will act as, you might say, an accessible tribal chief. And on the other hand, when he is with his Chinese bureaucrats, then he is the son of heaven. But he has to kind of, you know, play around with these different identities. And uh, the result of it is that the court gathers information on all sorts of issues that apparently the Ottomans didn't, uh, you know, feel necessary to gather information about. Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, at one point, one of the 18th century emperors says, I want to see what the inhabitants of my newly conquered provinces look like. And then, I mean, they send out draftsmen and painters who draw these people. And well, I mean, we tend to think, if you think of uh, Osman Hamdi, that this is very typical of late 19th century empires, that they collect, uh, you know, the uh, appearance of people in outlying provinces and the costumes and the way, their way of their arms, etc. Well, apparently in 18th century Qing China, this is very common and uh, the emperor gathers this kind of information. And I mean, a lot of this is, of co is written down or is drawn. Hmm? Okay, whatever you say. Uh, so therefore, I mean, the, uh, the Qing emperors uh, kind of try to start new fashions which then trickle down to the wealthy in the provincial towns who will think it's something really fancy if they have, you know, imitated goods that come from the imperial court. And uh, this is especially, I mean, in one of the articles that you will see, uh, there is, for instance, a, an, uh, a story about the, the use of metal, and uh, it's a copper, it's a mixture of copper and tin. And this material uh, can be used to make 
statues that look like they are golden, and they will stay that way for quite some time. And the Chinese emperors make statuary, Buddhist statuary, to send to Tibet or to send to the outlying provinces where a large sector of the population is Buddhist. And at the same time, they also install temples with this kind of statuary in Beijing. And the idea is that people will come on pilgrimage to Beijing because of these Buddhist temples. And this will then increase their loyalty to the emperor's court because the emperor has shown so much respect to their customs and their statuary. Well, I mean, just imagine an Ottoman sultan, uh, you know, putting money into uh, rebuilding a church or a synagogue. I mean, it's unthinkable. On the other hand, in, among the Baburi in India, it occasionally happened. I mean, there was a case of Shah Jahan. Uh, well, when one of his princes destroyed a Hindu temple and uh, the Padishah disapproved, he sent money to have it rebuilt. Uh, so, I mean, in, in India this could happen. Uh, but apparently in China it was common. I mean, it wasn't, the emperor wasn't necessarily Buddhist. He might have inclinations that way, but maybe not. But, I mean, the idea was to gain the allegiance of the outlying populations who were Buddhists by showing respect uh, to their beliefs. Well, I mean, this is the positive side. Of course, there are also, you know, when there are more consumer goods around, then you will find uh, some not so desirable consequences. And one of them is theft. I mean, if there's not much to steal, you don't hear complaints about stealing that much. But in 18th, there is a, one person in this book has done a study of accusations of theft in a certain county, reasonably prosperous, and uh, looked at who has, who complains about having had his goods stolen and who is accused of theft. And it's clearly, it has to do with social layering, typically moderately wealthy people complain. I mean, shopkeepers, uh, minor officials, students, they, they are the, you know, they have something that is worth stealing and they complain about market people, about porters, and, you know, the idea is these poor people are sometimes, I'm sure, without justification, uh, ex uh, accused of stealing. Now, the interesting thing is that we have a very similar study for 18th century France, where also uh, <laughs> textiles become more common, meaning even poor people have shirts, which wasn't necessarily true in earlier times. And when they have more than one shirt, the shirts are washed and the, the bed sheets are washed and they're hung up to dry in the garden and then somebody comes and takes them sometimes. So we have, the, you know, there's a scholar, a French scholar by the name of Daniel Roche who has studied accusations of laundry theft. Well, I mean, I was very much amused when I read this article uh, on uh, the thefts in Bar County because it was, you know, something very similar. And in both cases, you have a society, maybe not rich, but with a certain number of everyday goods that people of middle income have and poor people don't have. And then, you know, you get all these uh, accusations. Well, and then, of course, there is swindling. And since I told you, since the Chinese wrote novels, 
and uh, printed them, we have stories about Dolandridges. Well, about, you know, peop and one of them is really funny because uh, somebody uh, cheats a man, I think, out of his donkey by telling him all sorts of stories about his family and his mother, who is a lady of the court, and all sorts of stuff. Well, the upshot of it all is that he manages to steal the donkey. Mm, well, I mean, uh, I'm sure, you know, this sort of thing also happened in the Ottoman Empire, but was normally not written down. But those of you who have read Aziz Nesin, you will remember that in the 50s and early 60s, Aziz Nesin wrote very similar stories. And there was a, a Dalandarije, a trickster, by the name of Sulun Osman. And Sulun Osman made use of the fact that there would be these wealthy Köyalar village, you know, wealthy peasants coming into Istanbul to buy things without really knowing how to go about it. And I mean, he's supposed to have sold uh, land for shops on Galata Bridge. Well, anybody in Istanbul knows that that's not possible. Or he, uh, some, somebody wanted to buy a minibus to you know, uh, operate it between two villages or two small towns. And Sulun Osman persuaded this guy that it would be much better to buy a streetcar. And mm -hmm. then this fellow, poor man, went to the depot, which at that time was in Chishli, and wanted to take his streetcar. Well, I mean, these are the kinds of stories um, that circulated in 1950s Istanbul, because after the end of World War II, there was a larger amount of money circulating. It wasn't very much, maybe, from our perspective, but it was way more than people had been accustomed to. And then you get the same kind of trickster stories uh, that you find in these Chinese novels. And then, of course, there's corruption. And, I mean, uh, my friend Elif is writing a book about corruption. Uh, and since she's still working on it, uh, I haven't seen it. But, I mean, there are any number of corruption cases and, you know, people who get deposed and their wealth confiscated because of corruption. And there is, in this volume, there's one uh, such study on the basis of what something that we would call a tereke. Namely, it's a list of confiscated goods uh, that had belonged to a man accused of corruption. Well, in China, apparently, such people were not necessarily executed, but they were told to commit suicide. And, I mean, uh, that apparently happened to this person. And, well, we have the list of his belongings. Uh, which, you know, this colleague of ours has studied. Now, I mean, uh, as we said, all this continues into the middle of the 19th century when uh, the opium wars on the one hand and internal rebellions kind of, you know, end this period of relative affluence. And now let's take a look at what we've got on the Ottoman side of the story. I mean, we also, we have a great many post-mortem inventories. And in fact, when we started to, to plan on this volume, I remember saying, oh, well, if we're going to do consumption, well, then we have all these marvelous post-mortem inventories. And then Elif said, well, that's going to be tricky because there aren't that many in China. Apparently, they do exist, uh, but uh, maybe they haven't been studied with the same kind of intensity. While, as you probably know, in Ottoman history, we have a vast literature on, you know, terrorist lists, you know, ever since Barkhan started this in 1966, 
meaning that's now some 50 years ago, and I mean a huge bibliography has accumulated, and that also explains why we have three studies of such lists uh, for the Ottoman side and only one for the Chinese. It was because that sort of study wasn't so easy to find. On the other hand, I mean, uh, there are other issues where we had a lot of material for the Chinese side and not so much for the Ottomans, and you will see that when you look at the table of contents, namely that there are two, you know, there's only one study on Ottoman food, and there are several on China, because, I mean, as I said, it was, you know, something a, a gentleman was expected to know something about food and to appreciate food. Well, I mean, Evlia did too. If you have looked at uh, the work of Mariana Gerasimos uh, that came out some six years ago, uh, you will see that it's a big fat volume and it is only indexes of all the foodstuffs that Evlia has discussed with a commentary by the author. And that, came, you know, the result is a book some 500 pages thick, meaning that Evlia kind of shared this interest in food. But, I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, there aren't that many authors, and in China there are many. Uh, so, I mean, Arif Bilgin, who did the study on Ottoman food that we do have, it, he used price lists and found something really rather interesting, namely that quite a few new varieties of vegetables and fruits entered the Istanbul market sometime in the 18th century. Because, uh, you know, for instance, uh, something like artichokes, enginat, well, they were apparently very occasionally mentioned in the kitchen records uh, of the earlier period, but in the 17th and especially in the 18th century, they become popular. And I, was, I once worked on the Gebze region, and there you find an enginar tarlas, or enginar luk. So somebody had been, you know, cultivating enginar, and it's apparently not easy to do, meaning that in Istanbul in the second half of the 18th century, there was a market for this vegetable. Uh, so therefore, I mean, the price lists are very valuable, but, and, you know, people have worked on kavata, uh, which is a relative of the tomato but it's not exactly a tomato. And both uh, Arif Bilgin and a, a woman named Mary Ushun, they have both worked on kavatas. Uh, so as a result, I mean, you really have to look in Ottoman archival documents and because there isn't that much in the way of what you might call literary productions. Well, and then the same thing about, you know, something very interesting and intriguing. People write about cities. When Chinese people write, Chinese gentlemen usually write about cities, they write about natural beauties. They write about gardens, about rivers, about ponds, uh, about the fruit in the garden maybe. And uh, they will write about famous buildings, more or less a little bit like Evlia also does. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, yes, we get quite a few Ottoman uh, accounts of cities uh, written by people from the locality, but then they will usually talk about mosques and especially about turbes. Well, Evlia does this too, but he does other things as well. Uh, but, I mean, this, as I said, Evlia is really, you know, somebody who, whose interests 
parallel the interests of these Chinese gentlemen uh, whose works, uh, I mean, our colleagues have been using. Uh, well, and then, I mean, the, co the court is not really a model of consumption to quite the same extent. And I think that has to do with the fact that the difference between Istanbul and the provinces is enormous. I mean, I have recently worked on something else, namely the travel account of an Italian countess who traveled from Castamonu roughly to Jerusalem and back again on horseback uh, with a small group of people. And she, got, she had a property near Castamonu and she managed to come back in one piece. And well, being an upper class lady, she was invited, she had recommendations from all sorts of people, including the Mufti of Ankara. And uh, these people, so, so a lot of provincial, you know, wealthy provincials invited her to their homes. And she gave descriptions of what she saw. And if you compare this, uh, what Cristina Belgioso wrote, as opposed to the accounts of Istanbul homes, which had been written around 1830 uh, by an English woman, what you see is the enormous difference. I mean, for instance, in Istanbul wealthy houses, any number of mirrors. I mean, uh, people, some people collected mirrors. I mean, uh, it was a pleasant piece of luxury consumption. Well, Christina tells us about young girls trying to put on makeup when they don't have a mirror. And the result is not so great uh, because, as she describes it, uh, the, the young girl who's trying to put on makeup depends on the commentaries of her friends. Uh, you know, this is too much, put on a little more. And well, I mean, uh, it's very difficult. So there are all sorts of small everyday items. Oh yeah, they are, the girls are really fascinated by the fact that Christina, in those days women had long hair, and she puts up her hair in combs. And they've never seen that before. And then one of them says, oh yeah, this sort of thing exists in the houses of ladies who have seen Istanbul, but not, not otherwise. Mm -mm. Or window panes. In Ankara, window panes are a rarity. And on it goes. Well, all these things are available in the houses of wealth, wealthy inhabitants of Istanbul. So you really, you can't expect a trickle-down effect if the difference between, um, you know, these upper-class houses uh, that Julia Pardo visited in the 1830s and these provincial upper-class houses that Cristina Bergioso visited in 1855, well, the difference is so enormous. And I mean, uh, this came out because at uh, Sabanji University, a clever young woman had written a thesis on uh, Julia Pardo's Istanbul. And I was part of the jury. And I, that was when I became aware of the fact that the Istanbul that Julia Pardo described was so different from you know, what Christina saw in the 1550s in Ankara and Adana and other places. So, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the court does not act as a model of consumption to the same extent. And the difference between Istanbul and the provinces uh, are enormous. However, and that's really strange, I mean, you, you have to, you, this is an area where we are still feeling our way. And therefore, it's 
best to not go into great generalizations because it turns out that even in relatively poor households, some exotic goods are available. We have a study by a woman named Colette Estable, who is a specialist on Damascus around 1700, late 17th, early 18th centuries. And she has contributed a very nice article on exotic luxuries in Damascus. And what she shows is that most people's houses were almost empty. I mean, there was, they had very few household goods, but they had some. And what do you find? Chinese coffee cups. And I mean, we're going to see some of them in a minute. Unfortunately, I mean, you're not going to get very much out of, maybe later on, it, it may be better to look at the computer. Uh, because this I mean, is nothing at all. I mean, the, the blinds are drawn, but the yes, I know. Just <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, uh, for in in order to get a proper lighting, you would need some kind of dark curtain, yeah. and that's not there. Mm. Okay, uh, so coffee cups uh, are uh, not even terribly expensive. I mean, that's that's really intriguing. Uh, you can, uh, in Damascus, you can buy a Chinese coffee cup for a few akche, uh, so, or, or a few para, because they, they don't use akche in, in Damascus. And the other kind of exotic luxury is cottons from India. Uh, they arrive in large quantities, relatively speaking. Uh, they are also imitated in Syria and in southern, southeastern Anatolia. So even in households that otherwise, I mean, do not have uh, a great quantity of household goods, uh, you do find the coffee cups. And well, I mean, I have given you a bibliography on, or a reading list on coffee and coffee cups. And I mean, the, the reason why I, I made that is because of uh, the frequency of coffee cups. And I mean, as I said, in uh, Damascus in those days, they used Chinese coffee cups. In Izmir in the 18th century, uh, Chinese coffee cups weren't so frequent, but they used a, an imitation Chinese coffee cup that came from Kitahia. And uh, it turned out um, that these were extremely frequent. And somebody in the Belediya of Izmir had the great idea of sponsoring a publication of these various broken cups uh, that they have. And you can see that the high quality Kitahya ware was really from the early 18th century and that wasn't so visible. But in the second half of the 18th century, the quality deteriorated. But probably they also became very cheap. And so all over the Chasha of Izmir, you find these broken coffee cups, imitation Chinese, uh, typically. Well, and I mean, uh, so therefore, I think it makes sense to look at what was happening in China and what was happening in the Ottoman world in the consumption sector, more or less, uh, at the same time. Now, if we, I mean, time is probably running short here, yeah. so it is. So. Uh, as for the conclusion, first of all, I think one of the reasons that we know so much more about China, I mean, not I and not you, but the people who work on Chinese history have a lot more to, to work with. And uh, that is because writing about everyday things is much more widespread.
And for instance, or maybe some of you have seen this, there is a series called Science and Civilization in China. And when I first encountered it way back when in Ankara in the Middle East Technical University Library, I, I was absolutely green with envy. And I thought we should have something like that uh, for the Ottoman Empire. Well, the long and the short of it is we don't and we won't, because in, in China it was customary for judges who were maybe a little bit like the Kadha. And these people were supposed to be knowledgeable about the ways in which people made a living. So if there was a lot of silk manufacture in their district, then they were expected to know something about silk manufacture. If there was a salt mine in the area, well, then they were supposed to know something about salt mining. But they didn't learn this in school. I mean, uh, they were trained in the Confucian classics. So, you know, it's like an Ottoman Kadu who comes from the Medrese. Uh, only in the Chinese case, he has books. And because typically when a, 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 a district judge is ready to retire or he, is, he has already retired maybe, he will say, well, in my district people grow mulberry trees and they uh, raise silkworms. And I mean, this is not an easy thing to do. And I have collected information and I set it out here for people in the future to make use of. So there are books about road building and about bridge building because they have an, a, a whole volume on so-called civil engineering, which is roads and bridges. And there is something on textiles and uh, there's something on astronomy and uh, watches and clocks. So, you know, you, when you, you look at this you, and you're interested in such matters, uh, really there is reason to be green with envy. Mm, but, I mean, uh, well, that's what we have to live with. And, I mean, therefore, uh, I think because access to the written and printed word was on the whole far more easy than in, in, the, Ottom, uh, in the Ottoman setting. Uh, we also, you know, people were less hesitant about writing down things. And uh, in addition, painting and drawing. And I mean, in, in China, knowing how to draw or paint was an accomplishment of a gentleman. So we have these landscapes that you may have seen, long scrolls showing a landscape with small figures in the landscape. Well, that was considered typical of scholarly painting. So, I mean, there was a widespread <coughs> culture of painting and drawing and some of the emperors practiced this as a hobby. And therefore, again, I mean, we have Ottoman sultans who practiced music, uh, like Selim III. But to my knowledge, no Ottoman sultan uh, was ever particularly interested in miniature painting. Maybe Osman II, but he was on the throne only for five years. So therefore, I mean, the painting and drawing culture means that we have quite a bit of documentation and if we if this thing were a little better i would be able to show you some of this at least now these are these brass uh, brass vessels that we talked about and I mean uh, brass that looks very much like gold and on top of it unfortunately not really visible there's a piece of red coral 
and this red coral is, you know, something marjan, is something that is common enough in the Mediterranean, but in China it was a great rarity. And uh, therefore, it was limited to the imperial court. In fact, when foreign merchants brought red coral, it was purchased immediately, uh, I mean, uh, in Canton, and then sent to the imperial court. So presumably, this piece also had an imperial prominence. And this is something, again, which unfortunately uh, you don't see. It's a 19th century engraving, and it shows the shop of a pawnbroker. And it, it, uh, I mean, the Chinese also liked expensive furs, just like the Ottomans. But differently, in, when the summer came along, even wealthy people would pawn their fur because, um, I mean, it's difficult to care for fur. That's why not much fur survives. And if they pawned it, the pawnbroker would have to take care of it. And they got a bit of money. And then in the autumn, when the winter came along, they'd redeem their pieces. And then, I mean, the pawnbroker needed to know something about fur because he would need to know how much he could lend on a given piece. And so therefore, we have little guidebooks written for pawnbrokers. And you know, how, what makes a good piece of fur and what makes a bad piece of fur, and some of this is similar. I mean, Hulia Tesjan has written an article on fur in the Ottoman palace, and she also talks about quality criteria. Well, maybe they were differed in the details, but in general, there seems to have been uh, some similarity. Now, this is a European engraving, but it shows a Chinese pawn shop. And this one is a Chinese drawing, and it shows a woman repairing a fancy coat. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's hopeless. Uh, it's a receipt. Hmm? receipt. Yeah, well, okay. And uh, I mean, let's, and this is what I really wanted to show, because there you can see it says, image and description in Chinese and Manchu of the common crane, meaning Tugna. And uh, it's a, a piece that is from the collection of the National Palace Museum in Taipei. And I mean, Elif found it and got the permission. So, you know, when the, once the book comes out, uh, you will hopefully see it. And then, I wanted to show you the, some of the coffee stuff. Now, there are two miniatures showing coffee houses. One is from Cairo, and it shows people sitting in a garden by the river and enjoying their <coughs> coffee. And this one is very famous. It has been reproduced many times. And it shows the different groups of guests and up on top in those niches, the most respected guests. And if you look in the lower corner, there's a beggar. So, I mean, the beggar is here. And these very respected guests are here. Well, and the next one. Uh, now, the reason for having these is because these people are sipping their coffee out of blue and white cups. And of course, we cannot know whether they are original Chinese or whether they are ethnic or Pitafia imitations of Chinese cups. I mean, 
the, uh, the Chinese had an enormous uh, manufacture of porcelain for export. And I mean, it's really something. I was once in Seoul uh, where the National Museum has a collection of Chinese porcelain and celadon, which came from a ship that should have brought these things to Japan. Only, and they can date it uh, because there are inscriptions. And it, all this happened in 1320, meaning, you know, before the Ottomans even captured Bursa. And uh, they, you know, this, this place, Jingdezhen, was producing soft, uh, you know, porcelain for export at a time when the Ottomans were only just emerging as a principality. And they still do it because I went to the Jingdezhen homepage. It's easy enough, I mean, it's in English. And then at some point you get to a point and it says, if you want to order our porcelain, please click here. Well, I didn't, but as you can see, uh, you know, that's possible because Jingdezhen uh, was producing export porcelain in the 14th century and uh, is still doing so to the present day. Now, blue and white is something quite extraordinary because that is a Middle Eastern invention. I mean, originally Chinese porcelain was supposed to be white, smooth, like an eggshell, very fine. But the, uh, in the Middle East, people like those things decorated. And the Chinese caught on to this very quickly. And then, you know, they realized that in Iran, they were producing blue decorations on, on, on vessels. And then the Chinese started to do the same. And uh, Jingdezhen became famous for its blue and white manufacture. And I mean, there's lots of 17th century blue and white uh, all over the world. In fact, I mean, in, uh, we are getting to the end. I, once, a couple of years ago, I saw something quite extraordinary in the Denver Art Museum. It was a large blue and white plate, very large, and it said that it had been made in the 17th century in Puebla, Mexico. Puebla being a town not very far from Mexico City. And yet, when you looked at it, it was clear there were Chinese elements and there were Middle Eastern elements. And I mean, presumab but presumably adapted by local designers active in 17th century Mexico. But I mean, again, you could see ultimately, I mean, the, uh, the source uh, was Chinese blue and white. Well, I mean, in the end, of course, and that is what I really wanted to say to sum it all up, in the end, I mean, you have to keep in mind that this was a society much larger and also much more productive uh, from an agricultural point of view. And even if the Chinese emperors spent just as much money on wars as the Ottomans did, I think there was simply more left over. And that means, you know, that we have a, such a rich material culture. And f at the end, I mean, there are st still some rather handsome Chinese coffee cups surviving in the Topkapi Palace. And uh, two years ago, they had an exhibition. And in your reading list, there is this uh, whole book edited by Arsu Pekin uh, showing, you know, these various treasures uh, of the Topkapi Palace. And I want you to see that before we end. Here you can see you can see the bowls that they are drinking from, and down there you can see a real 
existing uh, Chinese code, and it says here, Dublin, Chester BT Library, the key album in the year Alan, or a Sulukla, Istanbul, the Achulan, if Kavahani, Temsil, and then Minyatu, the Mavi Bears, Punjanglar, La Kavi, Chen, Jivanla. And then underneath, it says Imperator Jiajin, Dangalu, Mavi Bears, Chin Porcelain, King Jonah, and it's from the top of the palace. And there again you see a, a coffee cellar. And now this one is, is fun because, I mean, this is a Chinese cup with a 19th century twist because the older coffee cups did not have handles. But at some point in the 18th or 19th century, uh, Ottoman consumers also liked cups with handles, because the older ones, you've seen them, they sit in a little metal holder, because many of them can't even stand. They have to be in such a container. And then, you know, the, this had become fashionable, and lo and behold, uh, somebody ordered a silversmith to produce a handle for this cup. And I think the cup already had been damaged and had been repaired, probably. Maybe also uh, the this decoration was made, maybe to hide something that you know showed the repairs. I don't know. But in any event, I mean, it's the original. The cup is Chinese, and the decoration is 19th century Ottoman. And these two are uh, Chinese cups. In, in the treasury of the uh, Topkapı Palace. Well, uh, thank you very much for your patience and for the imagination that you have all had to use in making sense of these pictures. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful presentation. We have some students writing their thesis on the uh, history of everyday life. But I, I don't see that here. Some, one is writing on clock towers. The other mm -hmm. is, I don't know, one of Names, I know something. And there are a few students. But I, I think uh, they, uh, they might be really interesting. OK, now the floor is open. Questions and comments. It's okay. quite short. Okay, less than seven hours. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I have a question uh, about more, not only the macro level, but connecting the micro, the cups, the forks, the spoons to the civilizational level. Uh, I'd like to hear your comment on. Uh, Norbert Elias's uh, theory on the civilizing process, uh, he connects the changes in the habitat to the changes in the uh, political uh, and economic systems, uh, but he studied like from the 13th century to the 20th century, like seven centuries in the Western, um, in the Western sphere. So my question is, from your exposure, from your experience and study, uh, how far do you evaluate the validity of expanding Yas's theory into other civilization spheres like the Islamicate or the Chinese or other spheres? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. But I am not really so sure that we are ready for this yet. Because, I mean, Elias, when he wrote, already had a very considerable body of empirical research uh, t on which he could build. And my feeling is, I may be wrong, but my feeling is that we don't have that empirical base as yet. We may, after, you know, a generation, you folks, uh, you know, become uh, fully fledged researchers and let's say in 30, 35 years time, we may have 
this body of research that will then allow us to, to say something meaningful. But at this point, we are using in the Ottoman context, uh, I mean, even the study of uh, Nakh registers for consumption is something that uh, Arif Bilgin has really pioneered. I mean, uh, because when uh, Barkan or Mibahat Katukolu, when they published these inventories, they were not, they were mainly interested, Mibahat Katukolu in the artisan world, and Barkan was interested in uh, things like uh, money ownership and ownership of landed estates, and he published these uh, registers for that reason, meaning that the number of people who have really looked at them from the consumption point of view is still very, very limited. And therefore, I have a feeling that we're probably not ready for that. But, but it's still applicable? It might be, it might be. I mean, at this point, I, I really don't know. Mm, it, it, may, it may be of interest or it may be completely meaningless. I, I really don't know. I'm wondering about what people thought of the quality then of the Chinese products, whether then everything was thought to be of good quality or the same as of today when you compare Chinese products to I didn't quite get it. Uh, Chinese product. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the quality, of course, could be different in both cases. I mean, sometimes uh, Chinese pieces were copied in Iznik faience, uh, which is a high quality faience. But other, in other cases, they were cheap, you know, they were kind of Chinese imitations for uh, the poor man's budget. And those coffee cups that recently came out of the earth in, in Izmir uh, were based, many of them were again imitations of Chinese originals, but they were of relatively modest quality. So, I mean, uh, you would probably get a large, uh, you might say, uh, a range of qualities. And uh, in the case of porcelain, maybe in the long run, we can also talk about what qua kinds of qual what qualities were imported. I mean, because uh, as I said, Jing Dejen produced for export. And how did the material produced for export relate to the material that was meant for wealthy Chinese families. Uh, I don't think anybody has really gone into that as yet, but it could be done. I mean, on the other hand, with Indian textiles, uh, we are pretty much out of luck because apart from Egypt, uh, they haven't survived very well. I mean, in Egypt, yes, and there are imitations of Indian fabrics that were exported to France and that have survived in the collection of the Chambre de Commerce in Marseille, where a Japanese scholar unearthed and published them. But, I mean, we know that this material was produced between Aleppo and Gaziantep, but there's absolutely nothing to, that has come, you know, uh, to our knowledge in the area proper. But in the case of porcelain, I think in the long run, uh, we may be getting somewhere. I mean, uh, people have been looking for broken Iznik faience for quite some time now, and it is possible to, to make a map of what kinds of Iznik faience were found where. And some pieces of Iznik faience are definitely adaptations 
of Chinese motifs. One of them is absolutely fascinating. It's, it consists of a bunch of grapes, so, or maybe several branches of grapes. And this is originally a Chinese motif. I don't know whether they produced it for export or whether it was popular in China as well, no idea. But uh, in the Ottoman Empire, this became incredibly popular. And it was imitated not just in blue and white, but sometimes also in color. I mean, you have a piece in the Sandbach Hanna Museum which has green grapes. Uh, but it's otherwise still a variant on the Chinese motif. So I think in the long run, by looking at imitations of uh, Chinese motifs in Ottoman faience, and by looking at surviving cups, we may get somewhere. Uh, but as that's again what I told you before, it's still something that is very much in its beginnings. However, I mean, on the other hand, we really, uh, you know, it's, it's something worth looking into. There is a woman at the University of Kaiseri who has studied gravestones in the area of Kaiseri. There are certain villages where people made very simple sketches of coffee cups and coffee trays and coffee cans. And they were shown on people's graves. Now, she, this woman, she did a bit of ethnographic research and she asked older people because this was done until the early 20th century. And she asked older people as to why they thought that this was there. And they said, well, maybe it was meant to celebrate the hospitality of the deceased person because, who, you know, he always had coffee ready for whoever came to visit him. That's a possibility. Uh, and then also some people said it had something to do with sevap, that, you know, you, uh, in the name of the dead person, you, you gain some sevap by depicting this. And then one person had a really eccentric explanation. He said, well, you know, on Judgment Day, there will be an enormous queue. And <laughs> people will be standing in line, waiting to be judged by the angels. Well, I mean, that's going to be a difficult time. And then, you know, the coffee cups will be there and uh, they, can, they can have a, coffee, a cup of coffee while they wait. Now, I mean, that was probably the creativity of this person. But still, I mean, you can see that people interpreted this in a variety of different ways. But what is so striking is that there are so many. And I mean, in this book on uh, coffee that was put out in 2015, uh, for the Topkapi Palace, there are some incredible photographs of these gravestones. And I mean, it's, it's really fantastic. And she, uh, the author thinks mostly 18th and 19th centuries, a few maybe older, some more recent because apparently it continued until 1930 or 1940. Uh, but, I mean, it's, I, uh, I can check it out for you, I can't say it right now, but I, uh, it's at home. Uh, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll send you the name. Uh, in any event, I mean, which means that all this stuff was available in these out-of-the-way villages in the Anatolian uplands, uh, some distance from Kayseri. And, you know, they had all the implements, including the coffee cups. And the other, you know, intriguing story, there was a, a, a British traveler by the name of Charles Doughty, who traveled in the desert, in the Syrian and Arabian desert, uh, 
in the last quarter of the 19th century. And he did really something that today we call participant observation. I mean, he traveled with a Bedouin group and uh, spent the summer uh, around a water hole where people had kind of, you know, assembled so that they had something to drink. And he tells us about the Im incredible consumption of coffee in those tents. Because, okay, I mean, some of the, the coffee was given to guests, but he said that it wasn't unusual for 50 cups of coffee to be distributed in one day. So presumably this Bedouin sheik had a lot of visitors and every time a visitor came, he was offered coffee. Uh, but still, it's an enormous amount. And yes, there is this Japanese scholar by the name of Kawatoku who has found documents on the Sinai Peninsula. Where, and this, these are disputes between the monks of the monastery of St. Catherine's and the local Bedouins. And the Bedouins demand coffee from the monks. And uh, traditionally, yes, the monks should give them food. That's tradition. But then these people write to Istanbul saying, but they ask for coffee and that is not traditional. And the answer from Istanbul is yes, that's true. It's not traditional but the Bedouins continue to demand coffee nevertheless. Meaning that, you know, coffee consumption is really something that, you know, it's not just something that happens in Istanbul and in Cairo. It happens in, by the 18th century. It happens in villages near Kayseri. It happens in the Syrian desert. I mean, I once found uh, you know, there's a town called Chorum, which is, I'm sure, not, you know, kind of the most, uh, let's say, innovative of towns. But in the, late, in the late 16th century, somebody had a malikane, uh, the right to collect taxes. And he sells the malikane. Why? Because he wants to be a coffee trader. And he's going to invest this money that has come down you know, from his family for, I don't know, several generations, and he's going to invest the money to become a coffee trader, meaning that in villages around Chorum in, in the 1590s, there was a market for coffee. Uh, well, I mean, all of this explains why I think you know, when we do research on consumption, well, that's really something that has implications kind of all over Ottoman history. And short question. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that there is a huge gap between Istanbul and the periphery in terms of mm -hmm. consumption. Uh, but we know that in the turn of the 20th century, governments developed um, tools to control patterns of consumption. Can we talk about something like that as early as 18th century? Like, no, don't think no, so. Not, not international trade, but also not also in the domestic patterns. Well, I think for one, uh, I mean, at that time, international trade really had not made many inroads into Ottoman houses. I mean, that is one thing that Colette Estable has found that, yeah, if people had uh, something exotic, it would be a Chinese coffee cup uh, or a curtain of Indian cotton, but the likelihood of their having anything from Europe was very, very low. And in fact, she was puzzled by this because she said, well, we know that French merchants in Saida sold their fabrics but we don't see them in Damascus. So they must have gone someplace else. Or some people maybe bought them directly in Saida. Uh, but the point is that uh, French woolens were not much of a, were not much in demand. So, I mean, I would say that in the late 18th century, even 
uh, or certainly in the early 18th century when SBLAS data were put together, uh, well, you, you don't really have that much of an impact of uh, European goods. Uh, that's a later development uh, in the 19th century, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you, you make some comparison between the Ottoman dynasty versus the, this Chinese dynasty. So mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the middle classes in each society. Mm -hmm. But you implicitly said something. Can you make more explicit, for instance, what you mean by, you said, uh, uh, Chinese emperor tries to make a fashion mm -hmm. out of what he wears, but Ottomans didn't. Mm -hmm. what, what actually do you want to get at there? Yeah, well, point uh, there? Uh, I, How you can compare these two things? Well, I would, uh, first of all, I mean, it's important to know whether the palace is something that people try to imitate if they can, uh, or if it is something that is so far beyond their life world that they simply see it as something, you know, that's like in the sky. And I mean, it's, you have a different view. Look, for instance, uh, I told you that the Chinese emperor, when he was with his Manchu generals, uh, that they eat and drink together. And that he even will, if he's young, he will serve the older generals. Well, I mean, this, this is something that maybe to some extent existed among the early Ottomans as well, because in many cultures, people want to see the, that the ruler is alive and in good health. And I mean, in the Ottoman palace, the Janissaries wanted to see that the Sultan was alive and in good health. And Guru Nijipolu has shown that until the reign of Suleiman, uh, the Sultan ate in a visible place uh, where the Janissaries could see him. Okay, but later on not. Uh, Suleiman withdrew and Murat III withdrew even further. Well, I think it makes a difference if people uh, have a ruler that they have never seen and that you know they can only imagine uh, or whether he is somebody that is visible at least to a section of the soldiery. And well, I mean, Shah Abbas, for instance, also made a point of being publicly visible because in Isfahan, the palace is located on the main square that was built when Shah Abbas made Isfahan his capital. And you have this talar, this uh, open hall. And when you are in the square, you can see people. So when the, uh, the Shah had a festivity, and uh, then people walking by could see him and could see his courtiers. And well, that's very difficult in the Ottoman world. I mean, sometimes when uh, Ahmed III was in uh, Sadabat, yes, you could get a glimpse of him. But apparently, I mean, the visibility or non-visibility of the ruler, I think, is something that you want to think about. In the same way, I mean, in the 17th century, Louis XIV of France, who wants to be an absolute ruler, he periodically eats in public. And if you, you, I mean, if you're a beggar, you can't come in. But anybody who is respectably dressed, including, you know, a craftsman and his family, can come in to the palace on that day and walk by and see the ruler eat. And again, I mean, this is, I think, meant to demonstrate that the ruler is alive and in good health. And that was also why the Janissaries wanted to see the early Ottoman sultans. And that's why Shah Abbas had his festivities in a place where pe people in the main square so, so could really meet this legitimacy. Apparently not, apparently not. And in the case of the, uh, the Qing, uh, 
Well, the fact is that they are a foreign dynasty, uh, which is very important in China, that they're not Han, and uh, therefore they have to build up a legitimacy among the Manchu, because they are the warriors, and they also have to build up a legitimacy among uh, the Chinese bureaucracy. And that explains why they, they play in different ways. Any more questions, comments, or uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.